itu. Welcome to the guest lecture, a step-by-step approach to conducting research in non-for-profit organizations. I'm Nining Islamia, Master Ceremony for today's session. I also would like to greet the Vice Dean of Economics and Business of Faculty of Universitas Erlangga, Bapak Dr. Ahmad Rizki Sridadi, the Head of Accounting Department, Ibu Dr. Wiwit Supratiwi, our distinguished speakers from the University of Western Australia, Professor David J. Gilchrist, yeah. our moderator, Ibu Yuliana Ekanyuru, all lecturers and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, the first agenda is the opening session. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our Vice Dean, Dr. Rizky Siridadi, Dr. Ahmad Rizky Sridadi to give opening remarks. Bapak Rizky, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bu Nining Islamia. Um, thank you all. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, wassalatu wassalamu rasulullah. The Honorable Professor. David Kliqris, Professor of Accounting from U University of Western Australia, and then the Honorable Mrs. Juliana Ekaningrum. Uh, she was one of our lecturers yeah, from Accounting Department, and also the Honorable Head and Secretary, Head of the Study Program, also, all of the lecturers of accounting department, faculty of economics and business, University Erlangga, and also webinar participant and colleagues, friends, and ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon from Indonesia, Professor David Gilchrist. It is an honor and Great pleasure as well yeah, to have cooperation with you again in the fourth accounting department guest lecture series. As we all know that, uh, according to the topic, yeah, that non-profit organization is a type of business organization, then that they should operate, yeah or must operate and provide its services without the primary goal of uh, making money. Meanwhile, we as a researcher needs to work in a larger context. When we started to conduct research or do research on that area. Mostly the crucial area in doing this type of research is collecting, managing, and analyzing, and also using research data and how to get solid and firm information from those non-profit organizations. However, basically, uh, we are very concerned with the systematic collection of information to inform non-profit program development and evaluation and the the field of that remains hard to grasp in its entirety because as researcher employ a multitude yeah, of similar yet distinct and key concepts the considerable range and complexity of these overlapping notions create major challenges. And I believe that all of us struggle to position their work in a larger context to identify on previous findings and methodological developments and also the research gaps. And therefore, I'm so thankful to accounting department and also the team yeah, for presenting the expert, Professor David Kilikris, once again. 
he will definitely get us yeah, to conduct research on non-profit organization. Lastly, uh, I do really hope that we can have many more collaborations yeah, with Professor David Gilchrist. Yeah. In this term, we are confident that today's guest lecture event and the upcoming series will be useful for everyone's improvement. Please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy today's session and to stay safe yeah, and keep well. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Dr. Rizky for every a very warm welcome remark. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to our main agenda, the guest lecture session. All presentation and discussion will be moderated by our moderator, Ibu Yuliana Ekaningrum. Before we start the guest lecture session, allow me to read her short biography. Ibu Yuliana Ekaningrum is a lecturer at a council department, Universitas Erlangen of Financial Accounting, Managerial Accounting, Information System, Investment, and in Intellectual Capital. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our moderator, Ibu Yuliana Ekaningrum. Hello, how are you, Bulia? Bu Yulia? Hello, uh, my name is Kutun B. Better. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My well, name. time is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, you. okay uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back, uh, David. How are you, David? Thank you very much, Juliana. Okay, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to this guest lecture with a step-by-step uh, -step approach to conducting research in not-for-profit organization. This uh, guest lecture is for, organized by Accounting Department of Universitas Erlangga, and I'm Yuli as the moderator for this event. Uh, before uh, we starting, I would like to uh, explain about our rules today. Okay, uh, my laptop is, uh, sorry, I need to uh, access my phone because my laptop uh, have a, having a problem. Okay. The guest lecture is being recorded and the guest lecture is being recorded and live stream. Please stay muted until call Hupan. Turn on camera and use Zoom virtual background that has been shared. Rename the Zoom account in the format name underscore institution name. And in the QA session, you can ask questions. Uh, in chat through Slido with the code number GL004. Uh, so let's treat everyone how you would like to be treated. And now uh, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker here. So I'm delighted to say that today we have Professor David Gilchrist, a professor of accounting in the University of Western Australia. He obtained a PhD from University of Notre Dame, Australia. Professor David Gilchrist holds a number of senior roles in the not-for-profit 
commercial and public sectors, such as Chair of National Standard Chart of Accounts Advisory Body, Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commissions, and Director of Baxter Lawley Advisory. David has research in the areas of non-profit sustainability, economic and governance, and has written over 100 industry reports and papers focusing on key issues related to the sector. So it's great pleasure to share this session with David. Would you please welcome Professor David Gilchris? Thank you very much, uh, Juliana, for that uh, introduction. And thank you too to Professor Sridhardi and uh, Professor Supratiri uh, and also Ms. Islamia for uh, welcoming me. I'm very slowly getting to know everybody. I've had such a great uh, opportunity for presenting over a number of uh, months now. Um, so it's great to be getting to know each other and also to be seeing familiar faces, uh, friendly faces in my presentations. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Hopefully, can people see that screen? Yes, of course. Yeah? yeah. And uh, you can see the slides there? Yes, we have seen your slide. Fantastic, David. fantastic. So my approach today, as you can see, is looking at a step-by-step -step approach to uh, conducting research in not-for-profit organisations. So I wanted to do two things, I guess, today. The first one was to set out what I would call a template for approaching research which in fact could be just as useful in terms of uh, researching commercial organisations or um, government organisations. So I'm focusing on not-for-profit though in the sense of talking about the kinds of things that you might do, the kinds of pitfalls that you can have when researching the not-for-profit sector, uh, but also uh, making some observations that I think are really important in the context of uh, just developing a research programme uh, in your own right. And that program needs to be developed so that you are being as efficient as you can be, but also so that you're leveraging, you're building all the time on the research that you're undertaking, rather than building on just purely um, project by project and having to start again, if you like, from a, a project uh, first principles uh, perspective. So to that extent, my approach today is going to be to look at the question, to look at the method, the research instrument itself, ethics, recruitment of participants, data collection, analysis and reporting. And I'm going to do that by looking at, because we've only got about 40 minutes, looking at the key issues that I think are really important, relevant to a not-for-profit research program, and the key issues that I think are important to highlight. So in other words, my plan is not to go through each of these things um, specifically or deeply, but rather to try and present to you a, a template for undertaking research in this particular sector. And I think that's a really wise approach at this stage because each of those elements, items A through to H, can be an entire presentation in their own right. And so being able to look at this um, in very specific terms, I think is important. The other thing to remember though, is that in my view, this area contains, or this presentation contains what I would call uniform components for research programs. So all of these things need to be considered right at the front of a research piece, um, a project just as you're starting to help you plan what you're doing and plan the way forward. You always consider these up front, as I say, so you always consider these before you consider anything else, even everything down to how you might analyse and how you might report, because everything's intertwined in a research program and you need to make sure those connections are made. The other thing that I've said here is that you need to document each of these steps so that you and perhaps people you're talking to, uh, working with rather in your team, are able to be on the same page so that they all understand everything that's going on, but also because you might want to replicate this project in another area or use some of the elements that you've identified in this project and developed for future research. And so that's the first element that I think is really important here, and that is that you need to research as efficiently as possible. And therefore, you need to think about this research program in the context of how you might replicate that without having to start from zero all the time. So actually building on your skills and your tools, if you like. So that's going to be a constant theme throughout this presentation. 
But as I say, I'm looking at the question, the method, the research instrument, the ethics, the recruitment of participants, data collection, analysis and reporting as the key heading areas for any project plan that you might develop. Before you start though, I think there's a really important thing for you to consider. That is that there's a group of things that I always approach a new research program um, by undertaking. And those things include things like developing your literature library. So not just undertaking a literature review, which I think is a really important point, and I'll come back to that in a second, but actually having the literature identified that is relevant to your subject area so that you can always go back to that literature and examine it without having to um, go uh, continually go through the library mechanism to search literature out. So EndNote is a really good example of a program that helps you to be able to collate things, but also many of my colleagues use just an Excel spreadsheet to have an index of papers, uh, not just the, the author, the name of the paper, but the key things that the paper covers as well. So what does the paper say? And sometimes an annotated bibliography is a really good thing there. This is an important research, as I say, not only for being efficient in subsequent research programs, but also in terms of being able to communicate that research to your colleagues in a research team. The other thing that is really important, and I can't emphasize this enough, is maintaining a research questions library. So often being able to identify or develop a set of research or to identify an area where you want to research is relatively easy. It's actually knowing which questions to ask that is sometimes the most difficult element. Because of course, if you don't have a question that is relevant, is new, is filling a gap in the literature, then your research is going to be able to be pursued, but it might not be able to be published. And of course, that means that there's a major output issue that you have as an academic in terms of getting your work out there and understood. So not only a literary library, literature library, but having a research questions library is a really important issue. The other thing that that helps you to do is to make a note of those research questions when you're on the bus, on the train, when you're walking to work, whatever, you're thinking about things, you think of a research question, you've got to jot it down so that you've got it collected, otherwise you will forget it. Um, the other element that is really important is having records or thinking about how you're going to record those people who are interested in your research and also who are interested in participating in your research. And this is a really important issue. I'll come back to participants and um, recruiting those participants to your research requirements, but it's important that you think about how you're going to record that data and also how you're going to make sure that data is secure which is really important. What you don't want is your participants uh, finding out that their data has been shared with people who sh it shouldn't be shared with. The other thing to think about is effective research methods in the context of the sector in which you're being involved. Now we're going to talk about qualitative and quantitative research, and we'll talk about the bookend research process um, in a second as well which is my personal favourite, the one that we use a lot here at UWA. But what I think you need to think through too is what effective research methods are relevant to the sector. So for instance, in the not-for-profit sector, a lot of people are happy to sit down and talk and to be interviewed, but they're less happy about filling out surveys and, and other instruments because of the nature of those people. On the other hand, you might find that the effective research methods for things like accounting information is much better to be surveyed than to have an interview process because it depends on whether or not you want people's opinions and feelings and experience or you want clear data that sets out specifically particular issues uh, or particular elements. You need to think about record keeping and recovery. So where do your records go and how do you recover your records and particularly how do you maintain your database of findings and your database of evidence. This is really, really important, particularly if you're a young scholar. Young scholars typically don't worry about these things because they've only got one or two programs or research projects that they're doing. But as you progress through your career, the numbers of research programs and projects increase quite a lot. And you want to be able to come back to those programs and that evidence to be able to use it and support 
your subsequent research with it. So again, about being efficient, thinking up front, particularly as a young scholar, what is it that I'm going to do over my career and what kinds of things do I need to be able to recover or use in the future is a really important aspect. So record keeping and recovery is absolutely important. As is participant recycling. So participant recycling means that you actually try to get those who are willing to participate in your research, so to participate in interviews, uh, group roundtables, or to take surveys, to actually collect those people, so to speak, and to be able to leverage those people in ongoing processes. So a big problem, as I've said, is a research question. What should your research question be? But an equally large problem can be, how do I actually gather data? How do I get in front of people to get those people to participate? So being able to recycle participants, so having those people in place is a really important thing. And I think in thinking that, thinking in terms of project versus programs of research is an important consideration as well. A program of research is a group of projects that is aimed at answering a whole lot of research questions. If you have a program of research rather than an individual project, then all of these efficiencies become possible, don't they? Because you're actually using and reusing evidence, reusing your literature, reusing all of the knowledge that you know in order to be able to expand your research and to be able to reinforce that research outcome. So the final point that I want to make on this slide is, okay, these things are really good, but we want to have a research program, not a project. We want to think in terms of research programs. Okay, so first and foremost, the research question it's, itself. I said to you before that I think this is one of the most difficult things for people to come up with because it's so critical to answering questions that people want answered, but also it's going to drive the research methodology, the instruments that you use, and also the analytical and other techniques that you might put in place. It won't be a surprise to anyone in the room to hear me say the literature review is absolutely critical. And I think there's two things, though, that we tend to forget about the literature review. The first one is that we want to um, undertake our literature review so that we can revisit that literature review and add to it throughout the program of research that we're undertaking. The second thing is that it's really well worth identifying that literature review and writing that up as a publication output. And it means that typically you will be able to identify things, gaps in the research, but you'll also be able to tell the world through your research output, the research that you're actually undertaking. So the final part of that article will actually set out what your program is and what you want to attack, which helps um, you to be able to set out to the academic world what it is you want to do. The other thing that you need to think about is whether or not you actually just want to replicate experiments that are being conducted elsewhere. So this is a not-for-profit specific comment. The not-for-profit sector is a relatively young sector, and it's a sector where there is a lot of green fields for research, a lot of opportunity for research, both in terms of specific questions that are relevant to the not-for-profit sector that haven't been answered, but also in terms of specific questions that have been answered elsewhere in government or commerce, but which we can rerun those experiments in not-for-profit to see whether we see any variation. So those replication of experiments are really profitable uh, areas for not-for-profit researchers to undertake because you get essentially two sets of findings. The first set of findings helps you to understand what's different about not-for-profits compared to commerce and government. The second um, set of findings allows you to identify what's the same. And therefore, your findings are going to be strong whichever way you go. So that replication of experiments, I think, is a really important thing. Of course, though, you might want to run new experiments. And this is really important in some of the key areas of not-for-profit organisation. For instance, if we think about volunteers and volunteer management, if we think about philanthropy, donations, government grants, think about sustainability, and we also think about mission and what those organisations are there to do, the governance over those missions. There's a lot of specific questions or questions specific to 
the not-for-profit sector that you need to take into consideration. So replication of experiments is a really good opportunity and probably a good opportunity for young scholars to try out their skills and to be able to develop their skills. Running new experiments, though, requires you to have a very good understanding of what's being done already in the sector that's relevant to you and what is being done in other sectors in the economy. From an Indonesian perspective, it might also be, though, that there can be replication of not-for-profit experiments generally because it might be that in Indonesia, certain not-for-profit experiments haven't been run, which might have been run in Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, the United Kingdom, and so on. So in other words, there is that added opportunity for being able to replicate those specific not-for-profit um, research agenda. The other thing that is really important, I keep saying these things are really important, and they are because of what I'm trying to do is to give you what I think are the key things for you to remember and to, to action. But one of the really important things that you can do in any research program, so not just a not-for-profit sector research program, but actually in any research program is ask those people in the sector what they want to know, what is troubling them, what concerns them. And that does two things. One, it helps you, of course, come up with a research question that's going to be relevant. And I think relevance is really important for any researcher to ensure that they're doing things that are important and they're going to contribute to the, to the community. The second thing, though, in asking the sector, it does two further uh, important things in terms of, number one, getting a question or getting engagement with the sector when you're asking them for their contribution as to what you can do is really important for subsequent recruitment of people who might respond to your questionnaires and respond to your interview invitations. In other words, if you ask questions that people want to know the answer to, then they're going to be more likely to participate in your research than to not. So I think there's a really important um, lesson there in terms of asking the sector. From a not-for-profit specific perspective though, asking the sector is really important, but you might also ask the government sector, the public sector, because government and not-for-profit organisations in most countries go hand in hand and therefore having an understanding of what government might think is important. The other thing with not-for-profits, of course, is you might ask commercial organisations and business people what they want to know because they tend to be the philanthropists. They donate to these organisations and therefore there's a real need for, to understand what those organisations might provide to those donors in order to be able to be more effective. So when you think about running those experiments or asking the sector rather, you need to think about who the audience for your output might be in order to be able to ensure that you're getting the right audience uh, to contribute to your research question and to make sure it's important. Um, so it won't um, surprise you then for that um, um, research questions element is to the final point is to ensure that you're considering a program of research. So asking people about what they want to see answers to is important, but if you get more than one research question, it might be that you have to have more than one research project within that program. There's two things that are really important there. The first one is, well, what order do you do things in? And you think about what's logically of the highest priority to those people who are helping you select a topic. But secondly, you have to communicate to those people who are contributing to your topic and supporting you about what your priorities are and what the time frame is going to be for those outputs so that you're not overselling. In other words, you're not telling them or promising them something that you're not going to deliver. And then they know when to expect things. They're not um, concerned about their contribution. Okay, so... The second element to think about then is method. Once we've got the research question, we can start to think about the method that is going to be used and applied in a particular research program. And typically, we've already talked about the idea of qualitative research and quantitative research in previous presentations. What I want to say here is that from a qualitative research perspective, we can have individual inter uh, interviews or we can have group interviews or what we call round tables, where we have half a dozen people sitting there. Individual methodology is really good because you get 
to that person and interview that person and you get their position. They're not crowded out by others. They're not talked over by others. They're actually able to give you their position. But sometimes a group dynamic is also really helpful because different people bounce off other people. And that means that they can, um, one person says something, another person responds, and that group comes to a consensus of what's important. And sometimes that can be more useful, depending on the research question, than having individuals who might say what's personally important to them. So a group dynamic is a really important one. If there's a lot to these, um, this idea of qualitative research, and we, we've already gone through that in a previous presentation, but that might also be subject to a, a further discussion, if you like, that we could do down the track. Quantitative research, of course, typically relates to a survey arrangement where you go out to individuals and ask them to respond to specific survey questions. But quantitative research can also be undertaken by looking at things like balance sheets and profit and loss reports, annual reports and other documentary evidence that might be gathered uh, from specific organisations where you don't have to talk to people, but you're actually just gathering data and then reflecting on that data as part of your, um, as part of your research program. What do we do here at UWA? We do a lot of mixed methods approach. So we use qualitative and quantitative research, and we use what we term the bookend approach to that. What's the bookend approach? The bookend approach means that we typically have a research question identified or a group of research questions identified after having done a literature review. After we've got those research questions identified, we come up with a list of questions we'd like to ask participants whether qualitatively or quantitatively, but we've got a list of questions. We then have either an individual interview process or a group round table process to confirm those questions are the right questions and to talk to people about what we're finding. That then allows us to firm up a better survey instrument to go to a bigger audience to be able to confirm our findings that we've had in that initial um, qualitative outfit. So in other words, we have an opening qualitative in interview or group discussion. We then have a survey, a quantitative survey, and then we have a closing interview or group discussion to confirm the results that we found in the survey or to ask additional questions that we might have forgot to ask in that survey or not understood that we should have asked. Surveys are always hard. You always want to keep the number of questions low so that people aren't in the survey all day. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're gathering sufficient data. So we call it the bookend approach because we go qualitative, quantitative, and then qualitative. We bookend our quantitative work with our qualitative work. So what are some of the things that I do think about in terms of determining your methodology and how you're approaching to that methodology? Things like the population size are really important. If you only have a very few people involved in a particular activity and you want to research that activity, then interviews and group sessions are probably better than surveys because surveys are not going to result in sufficient data for it to be statistically relevant to that uh, population. You also need to, though, consider your access to the population itself. So being able to actually get to people that you are targeting to ask them to participate in the research can be very difficult sometimes. We'll talk about recruitment in a second, but you might think about your approach in terms of qualitative or quantitative terms based on your assessment of that population and it's your ability to be able to access that population. You need to think about the nature of the research questions. If your research questions are about how people feel or their experience, then qualitative research is much better platform than quantitative research usually because you want to give the opportunity for people to talk through ideas and you want to examine those ideas closely because you're after what we might term the metaphysical um, uh, approach to that particular topic. If on the other hand you want to have specific gradations of how people feel and you want to be able to quantify that then a survey can be much better of course but it depends on those RQs. Uh, sorry the other thing that I would just say quickly there is that in not-for-profit research, often the stories are valued much more highly than the statistics. Often the stories or the examples are much more effective in communicate as communication tools than statistics relating to that sector. And we find that all the time. When we get to talking about reporting, 
I'll talk about this a little bit more, but one of the things we always do, even in our quant research, is that we always have a story or an anecdote that we share with the audience as well to bring those statistics to life because not-for-profits are about community, not about business statistics or economics necessarily. So the research instruments itself. In this section, I just want to talk to the research instruments, but probably um, raising some key issues that I think are important as opposed to going step by step through the process. And again, this might be something that we can discuss in another venue. But of course, I've emphasised the RQs, the research questions as being really important. Clarity in your research questions is absolutely critical. And so when you come to design your research instrument, that's when you work out whether or not your research question was actually clear enough because you need to be able to, of course, ask questions that are going to answer that particular research question. What you often find is that at this point, you might go back to your research questions and restate those questions more clearly, often adding more questions, but making them very specific rather than having fewer general questions. And so I think that the other thing that I might say at this point is that this is an iterative process. As much as I'm sort of saying you do A, B, C, D, you often come back to parts of your process to refine things as you go and as you learn. So you need to design the questions to respond to those RQs. And I think that's pretty straightforward. But those questions need to be thought through really, really um, cleverly to make sure you're actually asking the question and then asking subsequent questions that reinforce the outcome that you're looking for. The other thing that we always do here at UWA is that we ask what we call top of mind questions and then move to, through to leading questions. A top of mind question is something like, what concerns you about your job today? So it's at the very first, we're not saying uh, we might be interested in, in resolving a research question about uh, what motivates employees in academia, for instance. We're not going to say to you, what is it that motivates you as an employee of a, a university? We're going to rather say, what concerns you about work? Or what do you enjoy about work? Or what do you enjoy about your work day? And as you can see, that's a very open question and it allows people to go straight to the, the thing that's at the top of their mind, the first thing they think of as being relevant. And then as we go through the process, we start to develop what we call leading questions. So a, a top of mind question might be, what do you like about working at the University of Western Australia? A specific question might be, do you enjoy teaching that unit at the University of Western Australia? Do you enjoy doing this particular task at the University of Western Australia? Another example might be, what do you think could be made more efficient at the University of Western Australia? A specific question might be, do you think the accounting teaching program could be made more efficient? So one's a very general, what's on top of mind? What am I relating to? The other one is a question that is very, very specific and starting to draw out of you the specific things that I want to know about. But of course, we start at the top of mind questions because we don't want people to be thinking about the things that we want them to think about. We want to find out first and foremost what they don't know or what, what's important to them. If we change the order and to ask leading questions and then ask top of mind questions, we wouldn't get top of mind results because people would be thinking about what we've already implanted in their mind. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so the other element then is thinking about the demographics, um, which are absolutely essential. The order of question should be in a survey, particularly that you actually speak to the research question. So the, the key questions about the things you want to find out about are the first group, and then the demographics are the second group. The demographics are things like name, place of work, all of those kinds of things, age, salary levels, and so on. All of the information that's going to give you an understanding of the cohort that has responded to this particular question. They're essential, but they should go last, not first. 
The other thing that's really critical is thinking through the research instrument is how do you make sure that you're going to maintain the connectivity of the people participating? Typically, we use a rule where a survey, online survey, a questionnaire should take about 20 minutes to complete, not much more. On the other hand, we think an hour for interviews is really important. For group interviews, where you have more than one person around a table talking about a subject, we often say an hour and a half because there's harder to get as much out of each individual around that table. We don't do much more than that in terms of timekeeping because people will drop out of surveys and people won't come to interviews because they're not wanting to spend that amount of time uh, talking to people unless they really, really think that topic is important. The other thing that is um, important in terms of quantitative research is having a mixed question style approach so that all of your questions are differently approached. Um, some might be sliding grades or Likert scales. Some might be tick a box. Some might be um, free text where you can write your answer in. You need to mix up the question styles in order that people remain engaged with the questions and answer them. If they keep seeing the same style, they tend to not pay as much attention to the questions and not respond to them effectively. So we want them to do that, of course. The final point is the most important point with your research instruments. You must test your research instruments with your colleagues, with your friends, with anyone even in the industry group that you want to talk to. It's really important because when we write, and this happens to me all the time, I write a question down, I think the question's clear, I think the question makes sense, I give it to somebody else and they read it and they think the question doesn't make sense or they think the question's asking something different than I was asking. So it's really important that you test your instruments to make sure other people uh, read the question the same way as you do, that they understand the question in the same way as you do, that they understand what's being invited of them or asked of them in the same way that you do. I can't emphasise that enough. Testing is absolutely critical. If you get the testing right, then people will stay with a quiz or with a survey. If you get the testing wrong, they're more likely to drop out of the survey because they don't understand what it is you're looking for. Okay, ethics. Number one, ethics is critical. And I know uh, Elanga University has its ethics requirements. We have our ethics requirements here at UWA. Um, ethics is something that you need to think about from the very start of your operations all the way through. And you need to do that for a number of reasons. Number one, most participants want to be anonymous. They want their anonymity maintained. Also, we also, most people want to be able to, and they don't typically do it, but they want to be able to exit the process. Now, if they exit the process, are you going to simply delete all of their answers or are you going to keep their answers? So not only is anonymity and freedom to exit important from the participant's perspective, but these things are also important from your perspective in that if someone wants to exit at a particular point, what are you going to do with the data and how are you going to manage that data? If it's an individual interview, interview or an individual survey, it's not so important. But if someone's in a group um, discussion environment and wants to leave halfway through, what impact does that have, for instance? So there's two things about that. The first thing is you need to make known to people that it's anonymous and it's uh, you have freedom to exit. But number two, you need to be saying, okay, if you do exit at these times, this is what we'll do. We'll keep the data. We won't keep the data. We will start the discussion again or whatever it happens to be. But you have to think through in your planning how you're going to approach that, um, that outcome. The other element is, in terms of ethics, how are you going to source information? So are you going to ask people or are you going to look at um, documentation or ask people to provide that documentation? It, depending on whether or not you're going to talk to individuals, you can have a different ethics outcome in terms of how you have to approach it. I guess that means at the end of the day, one of the things that we try and do is see whether documentation already exists in our research. So if we have a re research question that relates, for instance, to accounting, 
then we want to know whether or not that information already exists in annual reports of organisations, in which case we don't have to ask anyone. We can just simply get those annual reports and we can work out whether or not that evidence helps us. The fourth point there, as you can see, is that you need to think about who has access to data and how you're going to store data. Now, remembering this is important for the specific project, but it's also important for the program not just for the project, for the program. So we often collect data for a particular project, but then come back to that data and use it for subsequent projects, use it for subsequent outputs. So remember the difference between a project and a program. A program is a group of projects that extends over time. To be efficient and effective, we want to make sure that we have the right access to data, the right data storage, and that we can come back and get that data, but that it's protected, that security is always in, uh, there. Ultimately, of course, that means that we have to be really clear about forward thinking. Always thinking at the planning stage, what are the RQs? What's the methodology going to be? How are we going to recruit people? How are we going to keep that data? How are we going to access that data as part of our program? as part of our overall program of research. Okay, so what about recruitment? And recruitment I mentioned to you before is a really difficult angle in all research, in my opinion. Um, if you want individuals for interviews and for round tables, it can be even more complex, but it can also be much more complex in the not-for-profit sector for two reasons. And this is just my experience. It might be different in Indonesia, but you need to think about these experiences. The first experience that I have is that not-for-profit organisations don't have much in the way of resources and therefore people don't have a lot of time to do things that are not relevant to their work. In other walks of life, they might have that in, in government or in commerce, they might have that ability, but typically in not-for-profits, they're hard up for that time. The other aspect to recruitment that's really important is how do you actually get to those people to be able to invite them? Now, there's a couple of approaches to how you get to those right people. Remember when I talked about research questions and what you want to research, one of the things I said to you was actually ask the sector what they thought was important. And I guess the other way of looking at, at that is, is when we're recruiting for our particular um, project, we might think about, well, who wants the answer? Who actually wants the answer to this research question? Who would find this answer useful? Sometimes that answer might be best used by government, but you might want to research the not-for-profit sector. So you might have to go through government to get to that sector to be able to get to those individuals. But the other areas that you might think about are industry peak bodies. So the industry advocacy bodies that might be existing at a national or regional level. You might also talk to professional associations like the accounting profession and so on. And that's typical. We're accountants. We like to research accounting. We want to get to accountants and auditors. We do that through the professional associations. But you might also have specific cohorts that you can talk to, like disability services, aged care, and so on. And so there's a real opportunity for you to really look at who wants the answer and then to go, um, go and talk to those people. The other aspect that's really important is what's in it for those people that are going to participate. They want the answer to the question because they want to use it for advocacy. They want to use it to make their organisations more efficient. They want to use it for strategy. What do they want it for? And how are you going to provide that answer in order that it's useful for them? In my experience, this is a really important question because academics, of course, want to put out journal articles, don't we? We want to publish journal articles in academic forums and to bring the, the knowledge base forward, to grow the knowledge base. That's really important, but industry don't want that. My experience of industry is that they want very specific, clear uh, outline of what the question was and what the answer is and how they apply that answer. So what am I saying there? The pitch for you to get people to participate or when you go back to those people who want the answer, when you're all talking to those organisations and asking them to spend their political capital to recruit for you, you've got to say, well, we will produce an academic article and that'll go into an academic journal, but we'll also produce what we call an industry report. And an industry report is written in layman's terms. 
it doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about methodology or prior literature or any of those things. It worries about what the question was and what the answer was, what the evidence is telling us. You do need to have access for people to come back and understand the methodology and all of those things, but it's not what industry wants. They want an industry report. Often industry reports include things like graphics, so pictures and cartoons and demonstrations, those kinds of things, which we wouldn't typically put into our academic um, uh, outputs. So this is a really important issue. If we can determine who wants the answer, and then if we can go to those people and say, this is what's in it for you in terms of that answer, then those people may well be able to help you to recruit people to the research program. Importantly, they might also provide you with research funding. So you never go and ask just for their help with recruitment. You ask for two things. One is participants. The second is funding. If they have an interest in that outcome, then they have an interest in providing resources to achieve that outcome. That's a whole different story as well, and I can talk about that a little bit more in question time or at a later point. The other way we do this is through snowballing direct re request or what we call panel creation. Snowballing, as you probably know, is the process where I send you an email to invite you to do something, but I also ask you to send your email on to your contacts and their contacts and so on to try and get as many people as possible. Typically, we use snowballing when we're concerned about um, those participants um, being able to um, answer a survey, a quant process. We want the cohort to be as big as possible to be able to ensure that it's as representative as possible. But panel creation is another way to do this. And if you have a research program that is supported by industry, you can often develop a panel that allows you to come back to the same people all the time. So we do this in a number of our research areas. We have a panel. Those people are on the panel for three years, not forever, but for three years. And we go back to them all the time um, to ask them questions. Now, to get them to join the panel, obviously, they need to have the attributes of the population we're keen to investigate. But also, we tend to say, OK, you're on the panel for three years. There'll only be two questionnaires a year that you have to answer or three questionnaires a year that you have to answer so that they know what they're up for when they sign up. But a panel creation is really important. It not only makes participation or recruitment easier, it makes the ability uh, for you to longitudinally assess what is happening a lot easier as well. So, for instance, if a new law was put in place to regulate not-for-profit organisations, then you can judge using a panel whether or not that law has had an impact at particular times over time. And therefore, you can add to those panel outcomes. As I say, we've done that um, many times in order to be able to look at longitudinal trajectory of industries. And of course, as I said before, participant recycling is really important. So if people need your answers and want to participate, you need to collect data to be able to go back to them all the time to be able to get them to respond further. Okay, so data collection. Just a few quick comments on that because this is a, a fairly big issue as well. But field time, so how long you want to be in the field is a really important consideration. Not just in terms of how long you want to be in the field, though, at the particular points in the year that you should be in the field. So, for instance, in Australia, as you may know, our financial year ends on the 30th of June. So we don't want to be talking to accountants in July and auditors in July because they'll be doing their work. That's the busiest time of the year. So not only is the field time itself important, how long you're in the field, but when you're going to be in the field is really important to consider. And then refreshers and reminders are important. So getting out and telling people. A lot of people want to participate and they are happy to say that they will participate, but they don't always prioritise it because they've got other things to do. So you've got to keep putting the survey in front of them to get them to participate. I think that's really important. The other thing that's important in terms of data collection is having uh, the target numbers in mind. And this is different from a qualitative to a quantitative perspective. Typically with quantitative research, we want to see more participants. With qualitative research, there's a limit to how many participants we can efficiently uh, manage and work with. 
The important thing about this, though, is not prejudging data as it comes in, particularly when we talk about uh, qualitative research and you're having um, iterative interviews. So you're interviewing person after person after person. Then you not you should not be prejudging that data or prejudging what's going on, particularly with those qualitative interviews. Making sure you're asking the same questions in the same way and not leading people to confirm things that you might have found elsewhere um, is a really important skill to build up. Um, you also might need to run your findings past participants when you're to undertaking qualitative research. This is an important consideration uh, because people like to know what it is that's being said about them. Even when it's anonymous, they like to have that feedback. So sometimes that's a really good thing uh, to do, particularly if it's a complex issue and their language is not quite as clear about their opinion as it might be. Um, analysis, just going through this very quickly now, considering the impacts of findings on industry is important. Those industry reports I talked about in order to be able to say to industry, here's your output, thank you for participating. Can you split the findings for more output? So in other words, don't put all of your findings into one journal article or one report. It might be that you can get more reports out of that finding or more journal articles out of the findings for that particular process. The other thing to do is remember to have next steps or next, top, next topics in all of your academic outputs so that you're declaring to the world the things that you're researching so that you're not picked at the post by others, I guess. Okay. I think we're, we've got five or six minutes for questions, if that uh, people would like questions. Um, I'm very happy to be contacted as well. And um, I hope that was useful uh, to people uh, in terms of being able to get a bit of a sense of how we go about developing our, finance, our uh, research projects here at UWA. Okay, thank you, David, for uh, delivering this significant topic. Uh, Actually, we have a lot of we already have a lot of questions here, David. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I have access to share the screen? Just trying to do that. What do you say? Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, David. Uh, I will share my screen about the questions. Uh, yep. For the first, to find the gap or novelty of the research, what should we do? Say that again. To find the gap or novelty of the research, what should we do? So the literature review process is really important. The literature review process. Um, always go back to writing a literature review or even an annotated bibliography. So you have an annotated bibliography just to make sure we're all on the same page. You've got the citation. Then you've got a paragraph about what that article is about in order to be able to understand what the literature is saying. The other thing that you can do that's really important is actually talking to industry to find out what's top of mind for them. So watching the news, talking to industry, understanding what industry is concerned about. Because the fact is, what academics are concerned about doesn't necessarily resonate with industry. Industry is not necessarily interested in the things that we're doing. The things that we do might be important to build knowledge, but they're not important at the coalface of industry. So there's two things I always do. Keep a literature review going and building that literature review. Always talk to people in industry. What worries you? What concerns you? What's good? What has worked well? Case studies are really good outputs as well to demonstrate things that have done good. Okay, thank you, David. So we need to collect the data from uh, the literature review and also from the company, what they need, actually. I okay. think so. Yes, thank you. And number two, it is uh, actually have a uh, relation with question number uh, one. What should we prepare if you want to do literacy review research? What should you prepare? Yes. Um, for literacy review research. Yeah. So what I do for literature review is two things. I start with the very latest literature and work backwards. So the very latest literature usually refers to two things. One, it refers to what's happened before. 
And secondly, it refers to what needs to happen. So I always keep what we call an annotated bibliography, always yeah. reading things and then adding them to the annotated bibliography. And writing that paragraph is really important because it helps with me anyway. It helps get it into my mind what that article was about, helps me to recur, but it also helps me to communicate with my colleagues without them having to go through every article. So that, that um, annotated bibliography is a really important resource for people when they work together with other people. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the question number three, uh, qualitative and quantitative are derived from different paradigms. Can we do both in the same time or do it sequentially? You've, in my view, you've got to do it sequentially. So qualitative then quant or quant then qualitative. As I said, we book in, so we have qualitative, quant then qualitative. Um, you can't do the two at the same time though. So there's limitations to being able to do the two at the same time. There are ways to do it, but I kind of think too, um, there's a limit to how much a uh, researcher can collect data and then think through whether they're looking at qualitative or quantitative data and how they're responding to that data too. I think it's much easier to break everything down and to do it sequentially. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. And then the question number four, I believe qualitative method can be easier to do in this kind of research due to limited data. What kind of quantitative data that mostly used in this research? Say that again. I'm sorry. I didn't understand the question. Okay. Also a little bit confused. That's I believe right. qualitative method can be easier to do in this kind of research due to limited data. What kind of quantitative data that mostly used in this research? Or maybe uh, the meaning of the question, if we uh, have difficulties in qualitative research because of the limitation of data, then we would like to move in the quantitative data. So what kind of uh, method that mostly used in that yes. kind of research? Yeah, so I, I think in this presentation, I've said all along, I think you need to take a program approach, not a project approach. And so we always take a program approach. We currently have four programs. One of those is the Australian Nonprofit Research Program, Accounting Standards Research Program. And so within that program, we've got a whole lot of research questions we want to ask. And as we are going along, we're using the techniques to be able to gather evidence. Once we gather evidence, we've actually got the tools to go on to do the next piece, if that makes sense. So I think taking a program perspective is really important, but also being able to build on over time those questions. The other thing that is important, I guess, in that regard is accepting that part of the academic process is being able to posit the questions. So a literature review doesn't just say, okay, these are all the things that have been found. A literature review also drives the questioning element as well. And so rather than saying, well, the not-for-profit sector prefers qualitative to quantitative research, I think you're building a program. And as you build that program, you build an audience of participants. As you build your audience of participants, then quantitative research becomes more and more possible. Thank you, David. And then the questions number five and number six, it is actually a similar questions about the challenge uh, in conducting research in Indonesia for a nonprofit organization. Since Indonesia, uh, conducting research in Indonesia, uh, there is a data access issue, which is the government often has some things that cannot be always published. Yeah, yeah. But it is important to research. So how to overcome this? Um, it's really difficult if government doesn't want to have things published. But I think um, I always approach it uh, in the planning stage. So you've got a set of research questions. Um, how do you approach those research questions in the context of your research program? Depends on the timing and the prioritisation of those questions as well, what's possible and what isn't possible. One of the things that we do in our research program here at WA, uh, though, is that where we think government will be very sensitive to things, 
or where it's not possible to publish in specific um, topic areas, we often publish history relating to the same question. So in other words, we don't say, okay, our current government should do ABC because they will be very unhappy. What we do is we say, in 1950, this happened and this was the outcome and therefore this was a, a positive outcome. So we look at it historically to try and keep the discussion going, but perhaps not get the obvious connection to government um, uh, to that, uh, that particular question. It's a, a really difficult question for me to answer in the sense that, of course, Indonesia and Indonesian people have their cultural and, and other situational um, priorities. So, so what happens in your country might be different to what happens in my country, and you've got to think about it that way. But it's going back to that planning stage, going through all of those elements, A through to G or whatever it is, right at the planning stage to identify where there's going to be hurdles. Um, and of course, if there's questions that can't be dealt with, and in Australia, there are some questions that you cannot undertake research on, or rather you can't publish the findings of research, then you've got to put those questions aside and spend your time focusing on questions that you can actually answer, answer and you can publish on. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the question number seven, ethical clearance is needed when the research involves animal. Do we need ethical clearance in social research? I don't know what the situation is in Indonesia in that regard. In Australia, you need to have ethical clearance for the involvement of any humans in research. So if I'm going to interview you um, in my research, I have to have ethical clearance to be able to interview you. If I'm going to look at documents, I don't need that clearance. Okay, okay thank you. And uh, the questions number eight is about how to encourage students to do research on non-profit organization. I think there's three things we can do, uh, we can say to them. The first is they can, research in the not-for-profit sector is very, very new in compared to research in business or in government. And so there's green fields. And that means that you can, rerun experiments that have been run in other sectors. So that's relatively easy to do, or you can design your own experiments. But secondly, the outcome of that research is really important for the community, for government, for everybody. In other words, if I research into business, I think that's important and I'll do research into business, but there's an audience for that research that are going to be benefit benefit from that research. When we research not-for-profit charitable organisations, we're actually benefiting the whole country because this is really important work that they do for sometimes the most vulnerable people in the country. And then thirdly, what we can do is start to develop some research programs between us, say not-for-profit UWA and Air Langer, and invite people in to work with us to develop a research project. And then we can compare results in Australia to come to results in Indonesia as part of that process. So that's a practical outcome, which we'd be delighted to participate in. But the other two outcomes I think are really important. There's great opportunity for research, great opportunity for doing th new things and repeating things that have been done elsewhere. And those outcomes are really good for the community. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, David. Uh, we also hopefully can continuous, uh, continuously cooperate mm. with you in the next future for yeah, well, uh, such kind of research collaboration. Absolutely. Let's get a program, <laughs> let's get a program up yeah. and running. Why not? <laughs> yes, David. Uh, from this question, uh, I'm curious about what kind of a significant topic that you say that uh, in non-profit organization is like a green fields. So there are many top topics that we can research in that. So what yeah. kind of a top significant topic in non-profit organization? Okay. So from a school of accounting perspective, I think there's some really important topics. And I might suggest too that you go back. Remember, we did a presentation a little while ago that looked at topics of not-for-profit research. I think it's worth going back to that um, presentation and having a look at it um, because there's a lot of topics there. But to me, there's fundamentally 
three topics that are really important. The first one is efficiency. So a charity or a not-for-profit organisation must be efficient. Mm. The second is it must be effective. The reason we establish not-for-profit and charity organisations is to do particular things. And often, for instance, in Australia, they get very good tax protection because they're doing these good community things. We need to know that they're doing those things. The third thing is, and I think this is a really important and a very big part of um, opportunities for both research and teaching, and that is that the not-for-profit sector is typically led by people who have very strong capacity in human uh, activities, so providing care, or they might be doctors, or they might be nurses, or they might be welfare workers. So people mm -hmm. that actually do the stuff that their charity or not-for-profit does, but they have a real deficiency, a real difficulty in the business of not-for-profits. The business of not-for-profits is when nurses and psychologists and other health professionals, for instance, have to make decisions about finance or make decisions about law or make decisions about strategy, corporate strategy and dealing with commerce, that's not their natural thing. And so I think there's a real education skills building opportunity there. Um, and all of those are areas we'd love to collaborate on, but we think are important here. And so for not-for-profits UWA, my research group, we look at the business of not-for-profits and we rank or prioritise our research questions based on what we think are really important business aspects of not-for-profit organisations. Okay, thank you. That was a news insight for me, David, and I am quite sure that it is so a uh, challenging result. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, David. Uh, we still have uh, three more questions. Is it okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the next question is besides accountability, what is the topic we can choose for doing qualitative research in NPOs? Well, accountability. Besides accountability. Almost, yeah. Besides, but accountability almost uh, impacts everything, really. Accountability is a fundamental accounting thing uh, in my mind. But setting aside accountability specifically, what can we research? Things like performance. Mm. So if you're a company, profit and loss and balance sheet are really important, as we know, because you've got to make a profit and you've got to dividend that profit. So if you're a listed company, you've got to provide dividends to your shareholders. That's, that's fine. If you're a not for for a charity, dividends or profits aren't important. What's important? Actually doing the things that you're supposed to do. So efficiency and effectiveness reporting are often more important than financial reporting. So in Australia today, and this is really hard, this is really hard area where as many, many people as possible can participate. But in Australia today, we have been trying to develop accounting standards to, re to report on performance for about 12 years. It's been really difficult. Yes. And so this is an area where people can really participate. And again, where we could do some joint work as well, because there's so much in that area. But it's so important because not-for-profits and charities are there to do things, not to make money. They've got to be sustainable. They've got to be financially sustainable but they're there, there to do things. Okay, I see that. Okay, thank you. And for uh, the next questions, could you share with us uh, any suggestion to avoid bias when collecting data from a limited number of participants in the qualitative yeah. resource? Yeah, so one of the ways to avoid bias, and it's, it is hard, um, mm -hmm. is to... Well, there's two ways to avoid bias, in my opinion. The first way is to have one member of your team who has not researched in that area before. So in other words, someone... So I've got 30 years' experience in the not-for-profit sector, which is really good, but it's also really bad because I bring so much history, you know? I bring so many ideas, uh, whereas young people come in and they see things because they've not... They've not got my, my uh, history. And okay. so 
having someone that's not connected to the sector or not connected to your research project can be a really good way if you're worried about bias. The other way to do it is that when you have interviews or group sessions, you have at least two academics present. Because if you and I are talking in an interview situation, I hear what you say and I think one thing, my colleague might think another. And so that helps mm. as well. Mm. I see. Yeah. I guess the, yeah, the third element is always, you're always in qualitative research got to think about whether or not you're biasing, your, your experience is biasing. Okay. Okay, David, thank you. That's good. Uh, suggestion for us <laughs> okay for uh this is our last questions david what is your opinion when you conducting research for a non-profit organization but they have profit in their organization should we keep the secret or publish it no um, uh, i think it's really important that charities and not-for-profit organizations make a profit mm. it cannot be sustainable unless you make a profit Yes, you're right. So you can't be sustainable unless you're honest and transparent, mm -hmm. but you must make a profit because how can you uh, build your balance sheet and do all the things you need to do unless you're making a profit? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, David, for uh, this significant insight. So uh, for me... Uh, this is maybe will change my habit for the next future because uh, maybe I, I have assignment to build my uh, program of research instead of a project. <laughs> okay. yeah. So yeah. maybe I have I will have a lot of assignment to read literate review and then drafting the uh, questions and etc. Thank you, David. Okay, so the, <laughs> so this is the end uh, of the guest lecture session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to remind you to fill our uh, to uh, fill our feedback form in order we can improve for uh, the next program. And also, uh, David, oh, do you still have time to join with us for uh, discussion for the next collaboration with uh, Dr. Ruby? Okay, thank you, David. <laughs> okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so maybe uh, this is for before we end this guest lecture, we would like to have a photo taking session. Would you please turn off your camera? Okay, uh, I will count until three. So one, two, three, smile please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I am as the moderator. Uh, I do apologize if I have any misspell or error in this uh, session. So we do hope that we can uh, see you again in the next uh, session. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum and good morning. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. Wassalam. Good morning. Thank <laughs> you.